Okay, welcome back. So, uh, today I will do some examples of further applications of the kind of uh, techniques that I outlined in the first two meetings, first two lectures, and leave it to tomorrow to indicate some really out there further directions and some of the proofs of things that I was promising to outline proofs of. Uh, at any rate, so, uh, an example of actually computing a Taylor function for an interesting lattice, uh, for Niemeyer's characterization of, uh, classification, excuse me, of even in modular lattices of rank 24, as simplified by Venkov using uh, weighted theta functions. Uh, what's sometimes called gluing uh, technique, apparently uh, permitted by Knazer, that uh, allows you to reduce questions about lattices of discriminants other than one to uh, techniques that you've developed for rank one lattices. And finally, uh, this neat matter of a shadow, I hope I'll get to today, if not, there's still tomorrow, which, among other things, illustrates, yet again, the appearance of these uh, intriguing conditions, modulo 8. Uh, okay, so, uh, <coughs> I, uh, okay, I have to find this, here we go. Okay, so we saw that last time, if you have a lattice L, in our n, let's say n is 24m, and l is even and self-dual, then, can that be read? Yeah. The minimal norm is at most 2m plus 2, in which case it is called extremal, and the theta series is known exactly. Now, so there are a few things I, that should be said about this. For one thing, uh, we don't know any examples of such lattices satisfying this 24M condition where M is bigger than 2. Uh, we know some examples of ranks like 80 and 88, which are not quite so nice in other uh, in other congruence classes because, again, you'd rather see minimal norm 8 for rank 72 than for rank 88. But even those peter out eventually. Uh, we have no idea, really, of whether we expect these lattices to peter out very soon, but we know they have to peter out eventually because for M really large, and I'm told that this is N roughly 41,000, there can't be any such lattices because the extremal theta function turns out to have the expansion 1 plus some constant c times q to the power m plus 1, where c is this constant that Ziegler proves positive, but there is some other constant, c prime times q to the power m plus 2, dot, 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 and it turns out that asymptotically, c prime is asymptotic to some constant minus m, times c. So if m is large enough, that for, it follows that c prime is less than zero, and of course the theta function cannot have a negative coefficient because there can't be a negative number of vectors of a given, uh, of a given length, and so that proves that eventually you're going to run out of such lattices. But there's a long distance between 48 and 41,000, and we don't know when that happens, and in particular, there is already a big open question about what happens in n equal, m equals 3. That's the first case where we don't know whether there exists an extrema lattice of, which is even in the modular of that rank. Now, have people tried to construct such lattices? Well, uh, okay, I'm again losing my notes. Here we go. Yeah, so basically what they do is they start, most constructions proceed something like this. Start with the one really nice example of a unimodular lattice in high dimensions that we know, which is to say the Leech lattice. And the Leech lattice has a huge automorphism group, so pick out 
some subgroup of isomorphism group, uh, Conway knot, which is ot of lambda 24, double cover of the famous uh, sporadic simple group that Conway discovered by considering the symmetries of this group, and it contains some tiny piece g, and you try to construct a lattice in higher dimension that generalizes uh, the one of the constructions of the Rich lattice with automorphisms by g. So, for instance, there is a construction which uh, has g being some simple, simple in the sense of elementary, not in the sense of group theory, simple part, but with the interesting part, SL2 of z mod 11. And if you then change that 11 to a 23, that gives you a lattice of rank 48, and that is indeed one of the uh, known extrema lattices of rank 48. And likewise, the Leach lattice contains a subgroup SL2 of Z mod 23, again, possibly with some, uh, with, with some twiddle, uh, you know, twiddle factors. And you can extend, you can generalize that, well, you can modify that from 23 to 47, and that does give you another one of the lattices that is known in rank 48. And so what happens when people try to do it for rank 72? Well, you could try here, but 35 is not a prime, and so SL2 of Z mod 35, well, I suppose you could define it, but it doesn't really have a nice 72 dimensional representation to try. However, there is such a lattice that you get by changing this 47 to a 71, which is still prime. In fact, it turns out, if you give yourself one of these, uh, these there's a natural family of representations, the dimension is always one more than uh, the prime, it's not quite irreducible over the complex numbers, it becomes reducible but over the quadratic field with discriminant negative 23, negative 47, negative 71, and it turns out that there is basically one such lattice for each of the elements of the class group, of which there are three here. One gives you the Leach lattice, one gives you the A124 Niemeyer, one gives you the D24 Niemeyer, and there are five here, and there are seven here, and you have to choose the correct one here to get the extremal lattice with that symmetry group, and you might think that it could work with 71 uh, if you choose the correct one there, and there is one natural candidate. And so, uh, now, the problem is that even if I give you a perfectly explicit lattice in some high dimension, even if I give you lots of properties of it, such as its or automorphism group, maybe the automorphism group is big enough that you can actually determine the lattice uniquely, it's a computationally infeasible problem, as far as anybody knows, to actually figure out the theta function. There's a whole bunch of such examples, barnes wall lattices, we know the first few coefficients, but not in general. There's the famous Thompson lattice, which is uh, even in the module of rank 248, has this beautiful symmetry group, no, no real idea what its theta function is, well, to find dimensional vector space, we know some, a few short vectors, but nobody really knows. And basically, once you get past dimensions somewhere around 24, maybe 48 these days, generic techniques don't allow you to, uh, to just compute what the uh, minimal norm is, what the theta function is, etc. So you have to work quite hard in each case. And so here's what happens for this lattice. It was constructed by Schultz Pio, Pilo, I'm not sure, uh, who asked whether it might be extremal. And very shortly afterwards, Gabriele Nebe uh, applied one of the standard techniques that one can use to investigate such questions, which is to just throw it into the lenser lenser lovas last reduction algorithm. Uh, and keep trying and see if you keep turning if ever, ever a short vector turns up. And in fact, very soon a short vector turned up of norm 6. Uh, so it's not extremal, but he was able to show that there are none of norms 2 and 4. So in some sense, that solves the problem. In another sense, it would still be nice to know what the theta function is. It's a natural lattice given by, you know, some finite data of an automorphism, you know, a nice automorphism group and uh, 
class number, how do you figure out how many uh, vectors there are, and by combining the theta function theory with some non-trivial computation and looking at the group structure, uh, I was able with the, you know, the help of some two really uh, good undergraduates, one graduating this year, one next year, Scott Kamner and Zach Abel, computed enough, found enough short vectors that we actually know exactly what the theta functions are. The theta function is, excuse me. There are this many vectors of norm six, and there are this many vectors of norm eight, and I claim that we have found all of them. Of course, we don't have a complete list of these, <laughs> but we have a complete list of, uh, of orbit representatives, of which there's only a few, uh, like 16,000, and so it's feasible to list all of them. It's after, after some, uh, about, I think, several days to a week of computation. And what makes this possible is, okay, remember there are no, co there are no vectors of norm two and four, so we know this is the first non-zero coefficient. We know that the zeroth coefficient is one, and so the, la the theta series is determined up to a multiple of delta cubed. But delta cubed, nicely enough, has a negative q to the fourth coefficient, so that means that whatever the correct theta function is, it's the one that starts with this, plus some multiple of delta cubed. And so if there are more vectors of norm six than we found, there'd have to be less vectors of norm eight, and vice versa. And that can't happen because we know at least that many, and therefore there can't be any more, and that's a complete theta series. So that's one application in dimension 72, and I promise that I won't take you to that high dimension again. Uh, so let's see, I promised to do uh, Niemeyer. So the Niemeyer lattices are what happens when you take n equals 24, still even unimodular, but no longer with the assumption that we are dealing with an extremal lattice. So, uh, which page am I on? I guess I'm on page, oh, this page, right. Okay, so remember that we were, our general technique for studying the distribution, the angular distribution of lattice vectors, was to look at theta LP for some harmonic polynomial, and that was a major form of weight 12 plus d, d being the degree of p, and it's a cusp form. It vanishes at q equals zero if uh, d is positive. Now, in particular, there are no non-zero cusp forms in weight 14. So that means if d equals two, it follows that theta LP is identically zero, and, that's for, and it follows from that that any non-empty shell of the lattice is a spherical two design. In fact, a spherical three design, but you know, as usual, the odd number is get for free. So that's a two design. And in particular, that's true for the second shell, well, first shell, because the, the norms have to be, uh, have to be even. And these are the vectors of norm two in the lattice, and those are the roots. Now, if you remember the formula that uh, uh, Professor Hanke gave last time for reflections, that involved dividing by the norm, but multiplying by two, and so that means the reflection by a vector of norm two, reflection relative to a root, is actually going to always take lattice vectors to lattice vectors as long as the inner products are integral. And that allows you to give a complete description of the root lattice of any uh, integral lattice. And so that means that, in particular, what you find is that the roots form some uh, direct sum, that some orthogonal, there are some irreducible root systems of type an, dn, and en, which are well known, and any root system has to be made up of some copies of each one of, some copies of these in orthogonal subspaces. So an for all n, dn, we usually require n at least four, otherwise they repeat previous examples, 
and en exists only for 6, 7, or 8. You could define it for 5, 4, and 3, but that just repeats earlier root lattices. And, um, <coughs> okay, so what do we find from the fact that a root system has to be a two design? Now, there are lots and lots and lots of ways of fitting some of these into 24 dimensional space. But most of them are not going to form uh, two designs. So, for instance, uh, if S2 of L is not empty, then it has to span all of R24. The reason being, if it does not span R24, there's going to be some non-zero vector uh, V0 that's orthogonal to all of the roots. And then you can look at the polynomial of degree 2, V0 dot x squared. And then you can try to sum it over the root system, you get zero, and you can try to integrate it over the lattice, getting something positive, and then those are not the same, and so that will give you a contradiction, unless, of course, the root system was entirely empty. So, however many of these we have, they have to span the whole space, the sum of the ends has to be 24, that's still a huge number, but then if you apply the same argument to x's in each of the... Uh, in each of the root systems, you find that the causator numbers h, which are the number of roots divided by n, has to be constant. The causator number of these root lattices is, are n plus 1, 2n minus 2, and then 12, 8, and 30. And that is a really huge restriction that you're only allowed to use subsets which span all of 20, R24 and have the same uh, Cogster number. Usually it means you're only allowed to use some copies of one of these. There are some exceptions, but you can see what they are. So if you have, you know, maybe uh, E7, you're allowed to use an A17 with it. But that already captures all of 24 dimensional space. If you have a, if you have a, uh, an A11, you can fit a D7 and E6 there. They all have Cogster number 12 and that does up to, add up to 24. There are only 23 possibilities in addition to the empty root system that gives rise to the uh, leech lattice. And the remarkable fact, okay, so this, again, as I suggested at the beginning, this is the development that was uh, shown by Venkov. Niemeyer had a much harder time classifying them. And so if you do the arithmetic, you find out there are 23 possibilities and miraculously, each one of them corresponds to one of the lattices found by Niemeyer. And you can actually check it for each possibility because, again, once you know a root lattice that is of rank 24, we are in this case that we have illustrated several times before, you have your lattice containing something you know, namely the root lattice in this case, of the same dimension. It has to be contained in the dual and so now you just have a finite computation, you need some sub-lattice between, well, you need some subgroup of the finite group R star mod R. And in each case, miraculously, there is a unique possibility. I mean, to give you an indication of just how miraculous this is, uh, a necessary condition for this is that the discriminant of R has to be a perfect square, R being the root lattice. Well, that's not too surprising if you're dealing with, let's say, E8 cube. But there are all kinds of examples like A24. That's one way of getting there. Miraculously enough, 24 plus 1 is a square, as is 8 plus 1 that you'd need to construct A8 cubed. That's the same kind of miracle that shows up when you, uh, when, when you construct Ada products and look at, at uh, major curves, but I'm not going to go there now. Uh, or to give this example here, A11 has a discriminant 12, D7 has a discriminant 4, E6 has a discriminant 3, and those multiply out to a square also. And what's more, it's a square for which the actual quotient group is one that allows you to find a, uh, <coughs> an isotropic subgroup, which isn't always the case, maximum isotropic. At any rate, there are these 23 possibilities, and for each one of them you have fine computation, 
and that allows Venkov to give the full Niemeyer classification in basically, you know, sound like 15 to 20 pages of Conway Sloan uh, instead of this huge computation that Niemeyer did earlier. So uh, that's the Niemeyer lattices. And, okay, so I promised you that I'm going to show you how to use uh, some of this theory to get at lattices which don't have discriminant one. If for some reason you're interested in lattices, it might have other discriminants. Uh, so here's an example, and this generalizes considerably, but I want to pursue this example a bit further. I give a few generalizations in the notes. Okay, so supposing I have a lattice in Rn that is still even, but for some reason I am concerned in the case where the discriminant of L is 3. Remember, if it was even and had discriminant 1, then n had to be congruent to 0 mod 8. If the discriminant is 3, you can't have uh, such a simple condition mod 8 because you have examples like the root lattice A2 and the root lattice E6 for which the ranks are 2 mod 8 and 6 mod 8. But these are in essence, the only possibilities. So either, well, okay, n is congruent to 2 mod 8, and then we'll have the example of a2, and if n is congruent to 2 mod 8, well, then I claim l star, the dual lattice will contain a vector v whose norm is congruent to 2 thirds mod 2. Or, n is 6 mod 8, and you have a vector whose norm is congruent to 4 thirds mod 2. Now, how is this happening? Well, okay, so L star mod L is a group of order 3, and the same kind of argument I showed last time with dual vectors shows that if you take any coset, the norm is well-defined mod 2. And what's more, it has to be one-third of an integer. If I take the non-zero, and if I take the two non-trivial cosets, they have the same norm because they're negatives of each other. The norm cannot be zero because if it were zero, then every vector in L star would have norm 0 mod 2. In particular, I'd have an integral lattice of discriminant 1 third, which is ludicrous, because the discriminant is the determinant of the gram matrix, which would be consisting of integers. So it has to be either 2 thirds or 4 thirds. So what I'm going to do, or rather what I'm going to learn from Knazer to do, is to say, let L prime be the lattice E6 if N is congruent to 2 mod 8, and A2 if n is congruent to 6 mod 8, and look at the lattice L direct sum L prime. That lattice in dimension n plus 6 or n plus 2 has discriminant 9, and it has a dual vector, which I get by either taking this 2 thirds and adding it to the 4 thirds vector in the dual of E6, or vice versa. So that means I can put that vector back in. This is called gluing because I'm, so to speak, gluing the lattice L to L prime to get a lattice of determinant 1. And then I get an even unimodular of rank n plus 2 or n plus, excuse me, n plus 6 or n plus 2 respectively. And because I already know that even unimodular lattices only exist in ranks that are 8 mod excuse me, 0 mod 8, also 8 mod 8, that means that uh, this lattice has to be in dimension congruent to 2 mod 8, and this one, oh, <laughs> I have begged the question here. This is, I'm going to this in the case where the dual norm is 2 thirds, and this in the case where the dual norm is 4 thirds. And that's how I'm going to prove that n is in the congruence class I'm claiming. Right, because here I started from my lattice in rank n, added 6 to the rank, concocted an even in the modular, therefore n plus 6 is a multiple of 8, 
therefore end the mod to mod 8. Likewise here, I did the same thing by putting in a two-dimensional piece and gluing them together. That means that n is congruent to 6 mod 8. Okay, so combining these two threads together, suppose now that I want to... Oh, and of course, those of you who uh, remember, which I hope is all of us, who uh, remember Conway's uh, list of invariants and say that they have to all add up mod 8, that's a, this is a special case of that, because saying the discriminant is 3 is saying that there is no invariance except at uh, p equals 3 and at um, the non-Archimedean place. And uh, the non-Archimedean place is n plus, is just the rank, and the invariant of 3 turns out to be, well, either 2 or minus 2 mod 8, depending on which of these cases you're in. And that's the condition that we are, uh, and that's the condition that the invariants have to add up to zero mod eight. Uh, okay, so to give just one more example, drawing these two threads together, supposing now n equals 18, that's two mod eight, I claim I'm actually going to describe all lattices of discriminant three uh, which are even in this rank. Uh, that might seem to be a somewhat contrived special case, but I've actually needed that to study some uh, singular K3 surfaces, but uh, that's a different one in school. So I'm not going to talk about, super singular K about singular K3s here. I will, however, say that in this case, there are going to be exactly six such lattices of discriminant 3, which are even. How do I know this? Well, remember that I made this construction starting from L, direct sum E6, that's a lattice of rank 24, and then I found that, oh, of course I've made the same mistake here. It's contained in an even unimodular lattice. The discriminant drops down from 9 to 1, but that makes the lattice bigger. So L direct sum E6 is going to be contained in some lattice N, which is even unimodular of rank 24, and is therefore one of the Niemeyer lattices. And there are only 24 of those, including Leach. But I can't use an arbitrary Niemeyer lattice. I have to use a Niemeyer lattice whose root system contains E6. And so that means that one of the components of the root system of the Niemeyer lattice has to contain E6. So it has to be either E6, E7, or E8. And there are only two possibilities in each case. I could have the E6, 4, or the E6, D7, A11, that I showed already. I could have one of the two that contains E7. Or I could have one of the two that contains E8. Each one of them, I can recover my lattice by looking at an E6 inside the root system. So one of these E6s, this one, or a copy of E6 inside E7 or E8, and look at the orthogonal complement slice. It's a general fact that if you are in a unimodular lattice and you take a primitive sub-lattice a primitive sublattice and its orthogonal complement have the same discriminant. And so this construction is reversible, and for each one of these, I'm going to get one of the six lattices of rank 18, discriminant 3. And yes, I did check that uh, this also satisfies the math formula for this genus, and so I haven't missed any. Okay, uh, how much time do I have to look into the shadows? 20 minutes, okay, great. Okay, so finally, um, where do we go here? Oh yeah, here it is. So this time I'm going to stay with discriminant one I'm going to stay with self-dual, in fact, but I'm going to drop the even condition. 
So actually, I'm back somewhere where I was the first lecture. So here I am. So this is the shadow, aka the characteristic corset. So here's the situation. We have some lattice L, which is self-dual, more generally integral and our discriminant is good enough. We are not assuming that it is even. So V dot V mod 2 doesn't have to always be, doesn't always have to be zero. But the map taking V to its norm mod 2 is still a homomorphism from L to the integers mod 2. Simply because the standard calculus mistake that the square of the sum equals the sum of the squares actually works mod 2. The discrepancy is twice V dot W. So, uh, because I am in a self-dual case, or more generally, in a discriminant case, any homomorphism from L to Z mod 2Z is represented by a unique coset C in uh, L mod 2L. So that's a characteristic coset. And it consists of vectors in the lattice, W, such that for all lattice vectors, V dot W, excuse me, yeah, V dot W or WV is congruent to V V mod 2. So you can recover the norm by taking the pairing with W mod 2. Now, a remarkable fact about this coset is where its norms live, the norms of the characteristic vectors. Now, if you take any vector, excuse me, if you take any coset of uh, L and 2L, excuse me, of 2L and L, so that consists of vectors of the form W plus 2V plus for a uh, fixed choice of W, and you look at the norm of such a vector that's equal to the norm of the vector you start out with, plus 4 times VW, plus 4, four times VV. So that means that the norms in any coset mod 2 are actually constant mod 4. So you have a map from L mod 2L to Deniger's mod 4. But for the characteristic coset, this number is even. And so that means that this thing here is congruent to WW mod 8. And so we have an invariant of a lattice which takes, which takes its values in the integers mod 8. So we have C, mod, C of L, which is WW mod 8, any W in this big characteristic coset. Okay, uh, so some examples. Supposing your lattice is just Z, what's the characteristic coset? It's set of all integers such that n times anything, n times x equals x squared mod 2 for all x. That is to say, it is just the odd integers. Any odd integer squared is congruent to 1 mod 8. So that means that this mod 8 invariant of this integer lattice is 1. More generally, if I took the integer lattice scaled by alpha for any odd alpha, that is to say infinite circular group, but the generator has norm alpha instead of having norm 1, then C would still be the odd integers, but the characteristic, uh, excuse me, the, the characteristic norm of mod 8 would be alpha. And this is an additive invariant, so the characteristic coset of the direct sum is just the direct sum of the characteristic cosets. 
which of course implies that the norm is just equal to the sum of the norm, so it's an additive invariant. So for instance, Vn has a uh, invariant of n mod 8. Now, I didn't require that my lattice should be even. So I, if the lattice does happen to be even, that's exactly the same as saying the characteristic coset is just 2L, right? So L even, if and only if C of L, the characteristic coset of L, excuse me, equals 2L, in which case, of course, it follows that 0 is the characteristic vector, so C of L equals 0 mod 8. And we already know that if the lattice has discriminant 1, this happens only in the case that uh, n is a multiple of 8. And in fact, that turns out to be, to, to generalize as follows. If L is self-dual and still positive definite, then all the characteristic vectors have norm which is the same at 8, and they are always congruent to n mod 8. So that's a nice generalization of the fact that, uh, of, of the fact that uh, even in a modular analysis only exist for multiples of 8. Uh, and again, there is a nice algebraic proof of that that you can find in, uh, for instance, in Serre's course in arithmetic. It is yet another example of the sum of, uh, if, excuse me, of the, of the sum of local invariants adding up to 0 mod 8, and it can be proved using theta functions in the, even, in the positive definite case. How so? Well, so remember that if you look at theta L, that's modular of weight n over 2, not for the full congruence group, for the full Major group, but for a congruence group gamma plus, which is of index 3 in gamma. But you can still ask how does it behave under all of gamma. So remember, gamma is generated by s and t, this being minus 1 over tau, this being tau plus 1. Gamma plus is generated by s and t squared. And to figure out then how this function transforms under all of gamma, you just need to know it's modular for gamma plus and to look at its images under two of the, uh, under, uh, excuse me, representatives of two of the non-trivial cosets. This is a group containing that one with index three. And so there's only two non-trivial cosets you need to worry about. One of them is just theta L of tau plus one. And that's relatively easy. That's just the sum over V of uh, minus one to the norm times q to the power half of the norm. Ah, but now is where we use the fact that the norm is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the norm is v dot w, where w is a characteristic vector. And so what we have here is you can write as e to the power pi i times Vw plus, and again, this is going to be Vv times tau. And now you can apply Poisson to that, and when you do this, you find that the remaining, um, the, the representative of the third coset, theta L of that, turns out to be a familiar factor, tau over i to the power n over 2, but instead of the theta function evaluated L, you have the theta function of what's called the shadow of L, which I denote here by C sub L. So what's C sub L? C sub L is the theta function of the shadow. The shadow is half the characteristic coset. So remember, the characteristic coset is a translate of 2L, in, by vector in L. This is a translate of L, of the last you start out with, by some half lattice vector. So for instance, the shadow of the integers is the half integers. This is say the integers plus a half. 
And what do I mean by the theta function? I just mean uh, it's a sum over all vectors in L plus W over 2 of the usual thing, Q to the power a half VV comma tau, except now V is not a last vector, it's a half last vector. And the fact that all the characteristic vectors have the same norm mod 8 means that all of these half characteristic vectors have the same norm mod 2. And since they have the same norm mod 2, if you translate this by 1, th this tau by 1, you will multiply them all by the same factor, and that same factor is some a root of unity, which tells you what, the what this uh, characteristic is, what the common, what this uh, invariant C of L is, mod 8. And, well, you do the calculation, and again, you use this key fact that T times S is a, is a, is a tree cycle in the, in the modular group, and you wind up with this weird analytic proof that C of L is congruent to L mod is congruent to N mod A. Excuse me. Yes, congruent to N modulo 8. Now, again, this is not the only proof that one can find for that, but this identity between the theta function of the lattice and its shadow has found various other uses. So, uh, by the way, this is, of course, an example of taking a uh, theta function for, that does not fall in the rubric of even in the lattices, and instead making it into the theta function weighted by some periodic thing, except this is a very special weighting, so instead of going to some huge modular group, you're still more or less working within gamma class and gamma. At any rate, so some examples of what has been used for, uh, if you try to use the same kind of theta function, expansion, extremality, etc., for unimodular lattice that are not even, uh, you can play the same game, but your notion of what's extremal is so weak that it never happens past dimension, well, somewhere around 8 or 15 or so. Uh, using both theta L and shadow, it's been shown in a series of papers, starting with Conway Sloan's, more recently with Reigns, that in fact uh, you have the minimal norm. Uh, okay, so this identity does show that the minimal norm is no bigger than, as before, n over 12 plus some small correction. So that's one kind of application. Another application is that it can be used to help classify lattices completely in small dimension. So for instance, in the lecture notes, you have a series of exercises at the end of which you use very little more than, uh, well, use the classification of root systems, plus the fact about the shadow to get all lattices up to rank 15, which are unimodular, but not necessarily, which are self-dual, but not necessarily even. Uh, now, in general, by the way, you can, for each rank, there is a finite number of unimodular lattices, but if numbers blow up eventually, they've been determined up to at least rank 26 by uh, Borchers, of which there is already more than 100, and it's known that in rank 32, there are literally millions, and so you probably never see the classification. So in some sense, I've used this to get essentially halfway, <laughs> but of course, the question gets much harder than increases. And finally, uh, in some situations, this characteristic cost that actually arises naturally, and I really don't know about geometry of four manifolds, except for some very special four manifolds have complex structure, but uh, I'm told that in some cases it is, uh, you naturally get four manifolds whose cohomology groups, I never know if I want to put it to here or there, I think that, yeah, I think it's this one, uh, whose cohomology groups form a positive definite lattices, a positive definite lattice, and the shadow, or, and it's integral by some kind of duality theorem, and its shadow actually tells you something about the geometry of the space. So at one point, uh, 
uh, Cliff Tobbs and uh, Tom Rovka started asking various people, is it true that V to the N is the only lattice self-dual unimodular uh, positive definite, well, self-dual implies unimodular, positive definite for which the uh, shadow vectors are as long as N, right? So remember, Zn has shadow vectors are all the odd numbers, and so an odd square is at least one. So the norm of a, of a shadow vector, excuse me, of a dual vector, of a characteristic vector, I should say, let me do this again. If W is a characteristic vector of Zn, all of its entries are odd integers, therefore the norm is at least N. If you do this for any other lattice that you know in the list of, let's say, 121 uh, lattices of rank 26, you find that the characteristic vectors always have norm congruent to 8 mod n, but you can always find one that's of norm less than n, maybe n minus 8, n minus 16, etc. And the question was, uh, is Vn the only example? And the answer is yes. And so far, it's again one of these final results that a statement is completely, you know, either algebraic in terms of self-dual lattices or geometric in terms of, you know, how close can you get to zero. But the only proof we know is using modular forms on, uh, on the upper half plane. So uh, that, that paper, again, is in the bibliography. And I guess I'll stop now. How much time do I have? Okay, great. So uh, maybe we'll have five minutes more to explore Sabina Canyon or to have lunch beforehand. So <coughs> stop here and conclude tomorrow.